Welcome to the broadcast, my dear fruits, my ripe fruits, as we approach this harvest season, this first broadcast of September, sweet September. And in that spirit, I must ask you, or remind you rather, to subscribe to the channel if you mean to be subscribed to it. Every month, once a month, I give this reminder, and every time some of you say you found yourself unsubscribed when you haven't meant to. So if you mean to be subscribed, press subscribe and click the notification bell, please. And I won't bother you again with that reminder for another month. And may I take this moment to thank you all for your engagement and juicy comments and humour throughout August. We had some fun, didn't we, my dears? And we'll continue to have fun. The King's been having fun. Our King Cozy Socks up at Balmoral. Yes, he's been having fun. It's been an absolute tonic for him up there in the Highlands and at the Braemar Gathering for Highland Games, where we see brother and sister here having great fun with their respective other halves. See what can be done when you have a mature approach to sibling rivalry. And sometimes there needn't be any rivalry. You simply accept your position in life and duty and get on with it without fuss and without all this palaver. King Cosy Socks was flaunting his knees, and a fine pair of royal knees they are too, my dear. Do you see all the wonderful fun they're having? The laughter, the gaiety, giggles galore, including between sister and sister-in-law. Wonderful. The weather was very clement. Actually, too clement by half. <laughs> I've got to tell I mean, it's glorious. It's gorgeous weather here. We are undergoing some sort of Indian summer. I know it's not officially autumn yet. We haven't come into the equinox towards the end of September. But for me, autumn begins in September. It's September, October, November. That's autumn for me. And as you know, that's my favourite time of year. I come into my own. It's my wonder. It's my wonder. The last couple of weeks had some lovely drizzly grey days for me. And now it's all gone back to hot July with this rather schizophrenic climate that we have here in the kingdom. It is absolutely blisteringly hot today. I was in such a grouch this morning. I managed to shake myself out of it. It's got a little bit cooler, but the thought of recording today wasn't a good thought. But I like to grumble about that kind of thing. But we are now in sweet September. We've got gorgeous harvest season. Oh, it's we're going to get so cosy, my dear, over autumn. This will be our third autumn together. Can you believe it? Here on the broadcast, our third autumn, and we'll be coming into sparkly winter as well. So lots of delights on the way here. Before I continue, I want to mention Prince Andrew because there's been an undercurrent of internet gossip about Prince Andrew. And I don't care about what bad decisions he's been made that he's made in the past at this point. We all know that his associations have been ill-advised and he's just been ill-advised all round, to be quite honest with you, my dear, and hasn't behaved immaculately. But some of the disparagements and aspersions cast upon him, in this case by some chap in a video who claims, I'm not even going to go into what the claims are, but they involve children, they involve two Ukrainian children, the claims are that Andrew was abroad, involved with these children, and I'm afraid I am not going to debase myself by even repeating these disgusting claims. What I can tell you without any moment's hesitation or with any moment's doubt is that these disgusting claims being made are total fiction. I'm pinning this to the start of this broadcast just because I don't want anybody asking me, have you heard? Are there any truth to the rumours? No, 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 no. Six trillion times no. That is not Prince Andrew, whatever you might think. And I mean, these claims beg a belief and there are some very mischievous people out there getting put towards spreading these sort of rumours, no doubt in exchange for something, something that the fact is no sane, reasonable minded person would see these rumours and believe anything, but they start and spread like wildfire. Wildfire. The Sussexes suffer from the same sort of stupid, ridiculous rumours, and so do the royal family. See, it's not just the Harkles, all quarters do. And it's like open season out there. And you look through the comments there are, and there are people on this video who are genuinely sucking it up and going, oh, the poor children, I feel so sorry for them being interfered with by Prince Andrew. It, it is really astonishing 
the muck that people put out there and that people believe. Because this is really sinister sort of stuff. So I'm not going there. We are going to return back to royal matters, but I wanted to make that very clear. King Charles was wearing an exquisitely tailored jacket. I loved the look of that. I loved the jolly red cosy socks. And the Queen was a wonderful contrast in green. And the Princess Royal was a dream in vivid scarlet. Doesn't the colour suit Princess Anne? Gorgeous, gorgeous, gorgeous. And Sir Tim as well, he's always gorgeous. But very bold here with blue and yellow to the tie. Which is somewhat of a, it's something of a hallmark with Sir Tim. You know, he's not afraid to get those colours a going. He's not. The king presented cups and trophy shields to athletes, including a championship shield to the Gordonston Pipe Band, which, of course, he has a long-running association with. So that was a hearkening back to his happy, happy childhood days. <laughs> OK, I'm being a little bit sarcastic. So those miserable, gloomy days of his childhood, my dear. And he'll be having good times now because he was in his new King Charles III tartan, the official new tartan that's based on the Balmoral tartan, set dating from 1850. Isn't he fine there in that kilt with his new tartan? And fabulous news for His Majesty because just one year into his reign, and not even one year, it's coming up this week, isn't it? The anniversary of the death of the late Queen. Can you believe it? A whole year has elapsed. Well, the king seems to have made a very good first impression because 58% of respondents thought that the monarchy is good for the country, which is a fairly decent majority. There's a great disparity in age because only 30% of 18 to 24 year olds think it's a good idea for the country. 77% of 65 year olds plus think it's a good idea for the country. So the older generations are more for it, but I'm sure that's always been the way attitudes tend to change with the maturing and ripening of the years. 59% of all question though think that the king is doing a good job, only 17% think that he's doing a bad job, which isn't, which isn't bad considering all the bad publicity that he's received in the wake of his son and daughter-in-law's aspersions. But his first son and our heir apparent William was voted uh, one of the most popular, the most popular, followed by Anne and Catherine. At the bottom, the fuzzy end of the lollipop was Andrew, <laughs> closely followed by Meghan and Harry, all coming up the rear end, I'm afraid, my dears. And something coming out of the rear end was Heart of Invictus, or should I call it Fart of Invictus, because it's full of hot air. And this is no disparagement to Invictus and the competitors of Invictus, or even Harry's great triumph as founder of the Invictus Games. It's a wonderful potential legacy for the boy. It's a wonderful one. But, as I say, I'm not calling it fart of Invictus for nothing, because some of it is full of hot air and full of guff. And I'm not the only body that, I'm not the only person that noticed this because the press have noticed it and called it out as being a flop because it has not reached the top 10. It has not reached the top 10, the hit parade in either the kingdom or the state. And are we surprised? No, I personally predicted this. I predicted that anything that doesn't involve constant, constant, constant disparagement of the royal family is not going to be well received or should I say well viewed by the general public because they don't care what Harry's got to say and that's why the only headlines that this fart of Invictus generated are ones that involve his continuing frustrations or hints at frustrations with the royal family but they're saying flopped 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 is just a great big flop I had a quick flick through it, but to, I will be quite honest with you, I cannot claim to be speaking on authority because I've got better things to do with my time, my dear. I am not going to waste away, what is it, five hours, five episodes on this sort of, this sort of affair, my dear. I'm just not. I had a quick flick through and it's exactly as you would imagine, full of very worthy people, worthy causes, fantastic people, wonderful people. No one's putting them down all their stories, which I'm sure are very interesting, but I haven't got time to listen to all of that. My dear. Not over five episodes. They could have made it a one episode affair. And the press have been saying this as well. It wasn't really that necessary. 
but I did, you know, sort of click through and try to see what Harry was waffling on about, and it was the same old, same old. His memories of how no one around him, while he was serving, or while he was in Afghanistan and returning, could really help him. There was no support structure, he tells us. Wow, 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 wow. And people have been pointing out, very fairly, I might add, that in the past, pre megan he was always crediting William with helping him. Yes, all the time, several times, crediting his own brother that he now disparages. In 2017, he credited William for helping him seek therapy. He told Brani Gordon that his friends and family had told him, look, you really need to deal with this. It's not normal to think that nothing has affected you, Harry. My brother, bless him, says Harry, was a huge support to me. They are his words was a huge support to me. Have you read his book? Have you read Spare? The way that he now disparages William, you know, for being this distant sort of renegade figure that didn't really want anything to do with his little brother and wasn't very forthcoming with any sort of help. Well, he's contradicting himself, isn't he, my dear? And this was also backed up, by the way, with all the promotion during Heads Together, their mental health and fitness effort. William and Catherine, in one particular piece that I saw, which is quite illuminating, have concern etched all over their face for their brother. You can see it for anybody who thinks that you know, Willie just didn't care about Harold. He didn't care about his brother's problems. He was the one suggesting help and recommending he go for help and seek help. You know, telling him you're not right, Harry. You need professional guidance and counsel. I always thought to myself, you know, what's the point in bringing up the past? What's the point in bringing up something that's only going to make you sad? It ain't going to change it. It ain't going to bring her back. And when you start thinking like that, it can be really damaging. And you always said to me, you said, you know, you've got to sit down and think about those memories. But for me, it was like, don't want to think about it. Yeah. It's very hard to marry what he now said with what he said back then. With what he said back then to what he rights in spare. It's impossible to marry, my dear. You have to prioritise, you know, prioritise your mental health. It's very easy to run away from it, you know, mm. to walk away from it and avoid it the whole time. You know, someone has to take the lead and has to be brave enough to, to force that conversation. One cut, you know, he says, why does everyone, co oh, I, they paint me as mad, Harry, you know. They try to disparage me, my calling me, saying that I'm inventing all this stuff, it's fantasies and fabrications of the mind. Well, you're, you're showing us this, my dear. Do you not get it? You're showing us this. You are totally contradicting yourself. You've done a complete spin on what you told us a few years ago, just a few short years ago. Harry says William kept saying to him, this is not right, this is not normal, you need to talk to someone. I've just said that, haven't I, my dear? Harry seems to suggest that it was the UK media in this documentary it was the UK media that revealed his location in Afghanistan, forcing his early return home. Um, recollections vary on that one, my dear, because the newspapers tell us that it was actually a website in the United States and a magazine in Australia who first reported it. Details, Harry, it's all in the details. In Fart of Invictus, Harry credits a moment in 2008 as being the inspiration for the Invictus Games. He says, as we took off in flight, a curtain blew open and I could see the air hospital in Afghanistan. Three young soldiers wrapped in plastic and bodies in pieces. I was angry that the media weren't covering it, but it sounds very harrowing and it sounds very horrible. But this is being disputed all over the place by the press and by Harry's old chum, who isn't afraid he's not uh, backwards and coming forwards, is he? This uh, Ben McBean, the Royal Marine, the war hero, the double amputee, who says, still love Harry, but again, I have to disagree. Not sure what media he's on about, but I know the British media did cover veterans for years. And he heaps praise on Harry and he thanks Harry, he's not a Harry hater, just as I am not a Harry hater. But we are not afraid to contest these completely ludicrous flights of fancy that slander the reputation of others, that slander Catherine and William and Charles and Camilla. Well, you know, my dear, there isn't anyone that he won't slander aside from him and the wife. 
is there? And this Ben McBean character and others also point to Help for Heroes, which was initiated at the time. You know, basically voices are coming forward to say that the media didn't ignore what was going on there. Yes, more could be done, more can always be done, and everybody, everybody, but everybody is grateful for what Harry wants to achieve with the Invictus Games and what he has been achieving and he gets recognition for that and will get re recognition for that but doesn't he want to bask in it and doesn't we doesn't he want to take a documentary series like this and bring everything back to him another character whose recollections vary on the royal scene is one that was associated with his late mother Mohammed al Fayed, who died at the age of 94 on the eve of Diana's 26th anniversary. He is the fellow who claimed that Prince Philip and Prince Charles conspired to murder Diana. This was his flight of fancy. And it's the kind of fancy, this is why I mentioned what I mentioned about Prince Andrew and the scurrilous rumours going round about him. You know, it's one thing if you want to believe whether he did or didn't sleep with a willing 17-year-old over the age of consent a few decades ago. It's one thing if you want to believe that and you have the right to believe that and it may or may not be true. It's another thing to then sink to the depths of the sort of rumours that are now going round about Andrew and children. You know, I point out these things because people actually hear something and believe it in their millions. And this happened with Mohammed al Fayed and his claims about Charles and Philip. People actually are willing to believe just because they hear it and it's a bit of drama for them and they can find things and add two and two together and come out with 666. You know, they can knit these things together and hold up some ragged old patchwork and a fine upstanding fellow like the late Duke of Edinburgh can be besmirched as a murderer and they're all in on it and they're all plotting against Diana and Prince Charles is so creep and so, so utterly wicked with such a hideous streak as son of the late Queen Elizabeth that he would actually plot to kill his ex-wife and the mother of his two sons. And they can really stitch this kind of idiocy together. Well... Mohammed al Fayed was a man who was in a deep state of grief and shock. And I have sympathy for that, but as I often say, my sympathy for others is challenged when they then turn their aspersions against other people and cause suffering for other people, uh, which he must have done for the late Philip and Charles, for all this nonsense about them consp conspiring to murder Diana. It said that Mohammed had a deep-rooted guilt for insisting that his own security be responsible for Diana and Dodi, Diana in particular. It happened under his watch. It happened under his watch with his staff. After the inquest of 2008, Lord Justice Scott Baker attacked Al Fayed's theories as demonstrably without foundation and insisted that Prince Philip and MI6, the intelligence agency, were not involved in the death of Princess Diana. And he ruled that it was due to gross negligence of the driver, together with no seatbelts worn and the drink, the drink of the driver. I realize this is also contested by the driver's family, but these were the findings from the inquest in 2008. But I bring this to light because even Mohammed al Fayed mellowed in the last few years. This is what has just been revealed by Chester Stern, who worked for al Fayed from 2001 to 2004. He did his PR, he represented him. Well, he has come forward to say that Mohammed al Fayed spoke to me about it all the time. It was a constant sort of feature in his life. It was almost an obsession. But he mellowed in his view as he got older. 
He had backed off it being a direct conspiracy theory by Prince Philip in more recent years and just spoke about an establishment conspiracy. Well, that's all very good now, isn't it? Now that the late Philip is six feet under or 20 feet in that tomb. I'm not quite sure. You know, it's all very well and good now saying it and backing down after he was so very certain and literally calling Prince Philip a murderer whenever he could to the general public in unreleased and unaired interviews. Who was it with? I was just reading today. Interview with, oh, Keith Allen, that troublemaker, who I'll never forgive for what he did to the family of Lauren Harry's. Um, he changed his mind. He mellowed. He decided and perhaps it wasn't Philip uh, personally involved. It was the establishment, the establishment at large. Well, you'll already smeared his name, lover. Just like Haribo smears the name of William and Catherine and all, and all these with various recollections and various obsessions. Will there be a mellowing of his thoughts over time? We shall find out, won't we, my dears? But you know, I bring that to your attention to show you how even people that are the root of these conspiracy theories, such as Diana being murdered, even the people at the root mellow over time and come to see that they might have been over-egging a particular pudding. And I'm afraid the fact that he was grief-stricken and couldn't come to terms with his beloved son's death and perhaps his own feelings of guilt, so I'm afraid that doesn't excuse him, in my opinion, for casting such wild aspersions at anybody else at all, let alone somebody with an immaculate record of service and decency as the late Duke of Edinburgh. And I'm not even, to be quite honest with you, the greatest fan of the late Duke of Edinburgh. I speak very highly of him because I do have a hugely high regard for his achievements and his spirit. Uh, I'm not an especial fan of his style and his character. Uh, there's parts of his abrasive humour that I very much enjoy and I'm sure that I would find it rather charming to be in his company. There's also parts of it that don't appeal to my sentimental Cancerian heart, that I'm big and bold enough to be able to recognise the fact that not everybody is everybody's cup of tea. And, you know, perhaps I wouldn't be his cup of tea either. But then again, perhaps he might have been rather charmed and tickled by me, you know. But I have no particular, a special affection for the late Duke of Edinburgh, but I can see, as anybody can see with a reasonable brain cell in their head, that he was not some murderer, especially as he liked the late Diana. He liked her, despite of all the trouble and mischief she got up to. He, he liked the girl very much and was very supportive of her. The things people trot out and the things people believe. But there is certainly one young gal that would defend the late Philip to the death. And that is, is his beloved granddaughter, Lady Lou. And she was following in the footsteps of her grandpapa this weekend, doing a little turn in her carriage. The carriage driving. She inherited the love for that sport, if you will, from grandpapa Philip. And it's wonderful to see her carrying it on, isn't it? And getting involved and hopefully we'll see her competing in this rare form of sport and enjoyment in the future. And then she took a more modern spin the next day in her blue VW polo. She took that for a spin around Windsor. She's preparing for her second year at St Andrews. I think she's 19 years old now. But yeah, second year at St Andrews, she'll be back off to Diggs, student accommodation shortly, of course. That is where cousin William also studied at university and where he met the love of his life our fair Catherine and future queen. Another queen is Beyonce, but she ain't no royal queen. She certainly is a queen of pop and rock though, and one that I greatly admire. And I think she is one of the most talented of her generation. I think she is a force of nature. I think she is an immaculate performer. 
But that's not to say that she hasn't made the odd mistake. And one mistake she made was forming a certain opinion about a certain girl after a certain interview. That interview was the Oprah Winfrey interview. And the mistake she made was suggesting that Meghan Markle had been divinely selected to heal and break generational curses. Do you remember in the Netflix documentary, Harry and Meghan were elated because Beyonce got in touch and was texting them. Oh, Beyonce's on the phone, Beyonce's on the phone, look, look. Oh my God, like I can't believe she knows my name. I can't believe she knows my name. Yeah, Rachel Ragland. Beyonce just texted. <laughs> She wants me to feel safe and protected. She admires and respects my bravery and vulnerability and thinks I was selected to break generational curses that need to be healed. These apparently were Beyonce's exact words in the text that she sent to the Harkles. She thinks I was selected to break generational curses that need to be healed. Really, Beyonce? Really, Beyonce? I mean, I credited her with... Uh, Dose more common sense than that, my dear. You remember that incident with her sister? Solange. A Solange. Oh la la, Solange. Solange, my dear. Do you remember that incident in the lift? <laughs> when she went absolutely animal. Attacking Jay-Z, the brother-in-law. And Beyonce just stands there in the lift. Cool and calm as a cucumber, as if it happens every night. One might have assumed that because she has experience with a sibling that takes to the old hysterics from time to time, whether warranted or not, you know, one might assume that she might have the maturity to see beyond one side of a story being presented. Apparently she didn't. Well, that's her right to make that kind of decision. We can query whether or not that was the wisest conclusion to reach, but I can assure you, Queen B, there is a real queen involved in these generational curses that you claim are being healed by Meghan <laughs> in Harry, healed or ripped apart and torn apart. What exactly has been healed? Well, Beyonce asked the audience of this gig to turn up in silver. There was a silver theme. And that is exactly how the Harkles rocked up with Dory in tow. And Harry in silver, like the tin man in need of an oil can. We don't want to see him attempting to dance, do we? And attempting some rhythm. William is the one with rhythm, I'm afraid, my dear. He's the one. He's got the moves. Yes, baby. He's got the moves. He's got the rhythm. You? No, my dear. <laughs> no, my dear. So there he is, the tin man. He has taken some disparagement in the press for wearing buttons on the left-hand side, which are traditionally worn by women. I say it's stuff and nonsense. I don't care which side the buttons are. And if he's wearing his wife's jacket, and people are saying it's not his wife's jacket, by the way, that this is just mischief, mischief making. Even if it is, good for him. I would be completely behind that. I think he should throw on some sequins too, you know, do a real proper Harry Styles. Nothing wrong with androgynous dressing or cross-dressing maybe. Harriet has taken to a bit of that over the years as well. Why not, my dear? Put out the old heels and stockings. Get spiced up, but just remember to shave your legs, my dear. Many of the press were saying he looked miserable and fed up and unhappy, and he did. But there are also plenty of photographs of him as well, looking loved up and happy, like any husband. But regardless, Harry got to do his own stuff a few days later at the football. He was watching LAFC versus Inter Miami, David Beckham's club, and Meghan was actually invited to this too, but she didn't turn up. They both appeared on a pre-match notable attendees form, but she was a no-show. And I don't blame her, I've got to tell you. I can't think of anything more boring than sitting through those kind of games. Sorry to any sports fans, but it's just not what 
makes my pants ping. But on this form they were down as Prince Harry and Meghan Markle. Well, I at least appreciate that if they had anything to do with it. No, Duchess this, Duke that. Some say they're avoiding the Beckhams because there's been some tension between them in the past. Apparently Victoria didn't turn up either though. And Harry was seen walking past. Brooklyn Beckham and Nicola Peltz. They gave just a cursory nod as they passed, but no warm cosies were exchanged and Harry was not seen with Mr Beckham, at least in public. So isn't that interesting? I thought he looked very nice in blue. That's one of the nicest outfits I've seen on him lately. I thought it was really nice. Blue and orange, which is the general colour of him, isn't it? Uh, we know that his colour blushes different colours for the different seasons, red in summer and blue in winter, but it gives off a general apricot glow of orange together with the hair. Orange and blue and orange are wonderfully complementary. They are at the opposite ends of the spectrum. The colour wheel, you know, they have the highest contrast between their exposures, so I expect that's why it looks semi-attractive. The latest whispers regarding Meghan's venture is that there is no plan actually to relaunch the TIG as it was. We've been talking about this relaunch, about Instagram relaunch. The latest whispers say that they don't want to use the same branding and name as the TIG for this forthcoming project. We will see. And it says that the applications regarding the name and its patenting are just a formality to keep control of the brand. Perhaps this has been a little bit of a steer by Ari Emanuel for Pastures New, but we do hear that this major new commercial venture, this source says, is genuine to who she is, whatever that means. Genuine to who she is? Well, I suppose it must involve fantasy and fiction then. Fantasy and fiction, if it's anything to do with who she is. It'll be fluff dressed up as virtue signalling, served up with cookies and bananas with I love you, you are wonderful, go rock the world and be an executive that knows what's key written all over them. In contrast to those trashy goings on at the other end of the lollipop, which is altogether more royal and more dignified, the king continued the late queen's tradition of inviting the sitting prime minister up to Balmoral for a weekend in early September. And he's been having a gay old time with the Prime Minister, Rishi Sunak, and his wife, the billionaireess, Akshata Murphy, who looked fantastic, I thought. I loved this green and gold affair. Isn't it lovely? With the mustard Panama hat, as the press described it. But I liked the look. Red, gold and green. Lovely. Anne provided us with yet another lovely turn in this dress coat and hat. And Lady Sue, delicious in blue there, isn't she? like a wonderful celebratory blue ribboned cake box on its way for the slicing and tasting. Thanks for joining me for this first broadcast of the autumn season. I look forward to seeing you next time. Do leave me a juicy comment and as I said at the beginning of this broadcast, please press subscribe if you mean to subscribe and tinkle the little notification bell wherever it is. Just give it a nice little stroke. Ta-ra my dears and toodle pips.